Welcome everybody to today's Zoom call. We have some questions to be get, to get started with. So let's jump right into the questions that people have submitted. And a reminder to everybody, if you have questions that you have thought about beforehand and you wanna make sure that they get answered on a Zoom call, just email them to the clinic. Um, just please in the reference part of the email, put Zoom call questions because we literally get hundreds of emails a day and they could get lost real easy. So please put Zoom call questions in the email. Okay, good question here. I noticed that the Rife machine gives me various frequencies over time. <clears throat> so that's right, when we write a program, there's various frequencies in that person's program. And they can range on a dwell, meaning that's how long that frequency is running, anywhere from five seconds, three seconds, to three minutes, <clears throat> sometimes longer. So let's go on. I noticed that it gives us various frequencies. That would mean that one program goes through different frequencies, actually. In my understanding, breast cancer, for example, has one specific frequency, and the Rife would target this by using the same frequency to make the cells go into lysis. Correct me if I'm wrong, my question is, what is the reason for using various different frequencies? If one cancer has one frequency that it dies with, what are the other frequencies good for and why are we running those? So I will correct you, you are not correct in this. So cancer does not have one frequency, breast cancer does not have one frequency that causes the cells to go into lysis. So Rife believed that if you could hit the cancer cell at its frequency, you could cause lysis. So let me back up and explain this. There's different ways that cells die. The normal way that cells die, so your cells, most your cells in your body will die and reproduce before they die. And they go through a process of cell death called apoptosis. It's really more of a recycling of those cells when they die. So the parts of the cell are broken down form these blebs, that's what it's called, break down your lysosomes in the cells, break it down and basically reuse the components of the cell. So it's like a recycling. There's another way that cells die pathologically, and that's called lysis. So if you're exposed to arsenic because you ate um, a rat poisoning and you died, <clears throat> it's because you had an overabundance of poison that caused cells to go into lysis and killed your healthy cells and you passed away. So um, lysis is a pathological death of a cell. That's the way chemotherapy works. Um, some cells can go through apoptosis with chemotherapy. Most cells go through lysis. And that's one of the reasons why you end up feeling sick with chemotherapy. One is that it's killing healthy cells. One is that it's causing healthy and unhealthy cells, hopefully more unhealthy cells, aka cancer cells, to go through lysis. And when a, cancer, when a cell goes through lysis, it literally just breaks apart. And you end up with all these what are called ex endotoxins, meaning toxins from your body themselves that you're then has to be carried away by your lymph system and, and, and deposited in through your phase one, phase two pathways in your liver into your gut and you have to get rid of them. So the, the, that's a toxic cell death and it could cause all sorts of problems. Well, I think what this person is referring to is that they've read some stuff on Royal Rife himself and he believed that the Rife machine, if you hit the cancer with its, just the right frequency, you could go through lysis because you can actually demonstrate that you could cause immediate cell death of a single cell organism. There's YouTube videos out there that show uh, hitting a paramecium right at the right frequency could cause the paramecium to implode and just break apart. And you'd have all these toxins if that paramecium was in your body. And that's what happens to bacteria when you use the Rife machine. Single cell organisms like bacteria can be broken apart and killed. Um, by hitting them at the, just the right frequency. But even that, there's multiple frequencies that a strep bacteria would have. Um, because it's functioning differently, it can have multiple frequencies. Uh, same thing with breast cancer. So a very specific breast cancer can 
there could be 200 different frequencies of that breast cancer. So there are, with breast cancer, for example, there's hundreds of different known frequencies that can effectively help breast cancer. Now, personally, I don't believe the rife causes lysis at all. I think the rife causes stimulation of that cell if you can hit it at its own frequency and causes your body to stimulate an immune response to it. When your immune cells kill a cell, it stimulates an external source of apoptosis. There's different apoptotic pathways. So when your immune system kills a cell, it goes through apoptosis, still not through lysis. So um, no, there is not just one frequency for a specific cancer. There's multiple frequencies. So when we write a person's program, we're putting in those multiple frequencies for cancer. We're also putting in other frequencies to help with liver function, help with kidney function, so that you can detoxify and you know stay as healthy as possible. Um, and so that's, we're not just putting in, there isn't just one frequency. There's multiple frequencies, and we're not um, solely um, uh, treating the cancer with your overnight program or treating the rest of your body to be as healthy as possible, too. And there's different times where people, as I talk to them on a case review, that they have multiple problems. So not everybody just has cancer. Maybe somebody has um, an issue with C. diff or somebody has an issue with H. pylori. We'll put pro that programming in their life as well because that's an issue that could kill a person too. So um, there's different things that we put in your program. So that hopefully that answers that question. Uh, oh, wow, did this cut this off? So let me make this screen a little bit bigger. So this question says, all right, so this over. I understood that cancer doesn't like oxygen. And therefore, it's a good to bring more oxygen into the bloodstream. Um, at the same time, many supplements are antioxidants, which sounds counterproductive to exposing the cancer to oxygen. Okay, so there's a difference between oxidizing agents and oxygen, which is O2. So oxygen in your bloodstream is beneficial. Your cells need oxygen in order to make energy. You need oxygen as part of the your different metabolic pathways. Cancer, um, by uh, uh, so cancer has multiple ways that it is sourcing its food. So it has multiple fuel sources. It can feed off of amino acids like glutamine and methionine and lysine. And it can feed mainly off glycolysis. So glycolysis is the way in the mitochondria of the cell that your body, the mitochondria takes, it takes glucose and breaks it down through this process called glycolysis to produce pyruvic acid, and then ultimately acetyl coenzyme A that goes into the Krebs cycle, not to get too much into biology here, but the Krebs cycle really kicks out ATP. So the purpose of glycolysis is to kick out ATP, energy, and then to finalize with two pyruvic acids that then uh, translate to two acetyl coenzymes A that then go into the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle and kick out a whole bunch of ATP energy. So that's how your body makes energy. It uses glucose to make energy. So glucose is necessary. So if you didn't have any glucose in your system, you would die. So, but if you have too much glucose, it can affect the cell membranes and it could cause what's called diabetes. We won't get into that. But cancer, you've heard, is cancer is fed by sugar. So stay away from sugar. Yes, you should stay away from um, gross sugars like cookies, cakes, and candies and things. But we don't want to eliminate all glucose all the time. Your healthy cells need glucose to make energy, and you would be very fatigued if you're in a state of hypoglycemia. Well, through the glycolysis and through the Krebs cycle, uh, especially the Krebs cycle, you need oxygen. So th that's another cofactor in the Krebs cycle. So if a person isn't breathing well, it is, has a low uh, blood oxygen content, then they can 
decrease their amount of ATP energy made. And that can be not a good thing. Um, and a decreased amount of oxygen can leave a lot of the endpoint of glycolysis, pyruvic acid, in the system. Pyruvic acid is really the culprit that cancer feeds on. So cancer feeds on pyruvic acid, not so much sugar, but well, well, sugar breaks down to glucose and sugar breaks down to pyruvic acid. And that's really what the thing that cancer feeds on. So if a cancer patient is deficient in oxygen, AKA they're laying around a lot and not getting exercise, then they can um, be uh, deficient in oxygen and they can have excess pyruvic acid. Another word for pyruvic acid is pyruvate. So if you have excess pyruvate, pyruvic acid in your system, it can be a fuel source for cancer. Well, we don't want that. So one of the ways that you can help is to decrease the amount of sweets that you're eating. A question came in, is fruit a good source of glucose? Well, fruit is a source of fructose that does break down to glucose. So, uh, uh, but fruit has other benefits and other nutritional pieces to it. So fruit is much better source of, of sugar in your body than eating sugar, uh, cane sugar, table sugar, cookies, cakes, other simple carbohydrates. Um, so we don't want excess pyruvate in our body. So oxygen helps decrease that pyruvate. When we're talking about oxidizing agents, that's a totally different thing. So oxidizing agents damage our cell membranes. Oxidizing agents, the one class of oxidizing agents is a poison. Really an oxidizing agent is a poison. And to what degree that you're exposed to that oxidizing agent is the damage that you'll have. A person could eat, could drink some water laced with benzene, which is an oxidizing agent, and depending on how much is in there, it could either kill them or it could damage their cells, it could damage their heart, whatever, wherever that oxidizing agent gets to. Of course, your heart is going to be a major call for blood sugar, uh, glycolysis, and um, uh, your first call for nutrition. And that could be the thing that's damaged and it could kill a person or could damage their heart for life, even if they survive. Um, so an oxidizing agent can cause cancer. So uh, glyphosates, uh, herbicides, things like that are oxidizing agents and they can damage cell membranes, damage mitochondria, damage other components of the cell and can be a cause of cancer. So you want antioxidants. So again, step back, understand chemotherapy is an oxidizing agent. Well, it's bad then. Well, it could cause cancer. Well, yes, chemotherapy can cause cancer. The idea is we're going to give just the right amount that it's going to kill the cells that are the bad guys. So we're going to kill the cancer before we kill the patient, we hope. So that's the idea of chemotherapy. I'm not knocking chemotherapy, but that's just what it is. So, um, but oxidizing agents can cause cancer, can cause other things. So we do want to decrease our burden of oxidizing agents when, we're, when we have any disease process or even before we have a disease process would even be better so that it would help us from possibly getting some disease processes. How do you do that? You take specific antioxidants. Well, question was about fruit. Fruits have antioxidants in it. So you could get a lot of this nutrition through your food. So the idea of supplementing using a supplement like alpha lipoic acid, vitamin C, curcumin, uh, different things like that, they're oxidizing agents. That's one component of how those things work. They do other things too, they're immune stimulants and other things, but they have antioxidant um, capabilities. So they're antioxidizing agents. So you take antioxidants to decrease your um, uh, load of oxidizing agents that we're all exposed to. You went and pumped gas and breathed in those gas fumes. Those are oxidizing agents. You take vitamin C, you take alpha lipoic acid, you take N-acetylcysteine, you take um, glutathione producers and stimulants to help 
get rid of those things and help protect your cells. So don't confuse oxidants, meaning oxygen, to, to oxidants, meaning oxidizing agents, which are poisons. Uh, I probably gave you way too many words to answer that question. Sorry about that. Next question. I am on the so-called chemo tablets, which I take twice a day. And I am also taking a lot of supplements, some antioxidants. Dr. Connors mentioned that we will speak on this later. So here's a good time to do so. So I would like to pick it up and would be happy to get more insights into this topic of oxidizing chemo tablets and taking antioxidants. So the question is, is what do I do if I'm on chemotherapy? My, my oncologist doesn't want me on any supplements because he doesn't want me on antioxidants while I'm doing chemotherapy. Well, if I'm on chemotherapy infusions once every three weeks, I would agree. There's about a 48 hour window that um, the chemotherapy is really working. So stay away from any antioxidants during that 48 hour window. So part of our chemotherapy protocol is during that 48 hour window after chemotherapy, don't take any alpha lipoic acid and, a, uh, and acetylcysteine or vitamin C. Um, the main antioxidants, stay away from those during that 48 hour window. But what do I do if I'm on a daily chemo pill? Do I just not take any antioxidants anymore? Well, that's where it gets a little confusing and you kind of got to weigh this out. Well, if I take an antioxidant, an alpha lipoic acid, same time I take my chemo pill, could it be reducing the effect of the chemo pill? Well, it could. Now, so if you're going to take the oncologist standard of medicine point of view, yes, it will. So don't take an antioxidant while you're doing any chemo, including a chemo pill. My approach is, and then there's the, far right approach of the uh, nutritionist who says, no, it won't. The antioxidant is going to protect your healthy cells first. Um, it's not going to be protecting your cancer cells. Um, and there may be a lot of truth to that. My approach is more middle of the ground. If you're taking a chemo pill once a day, then take your antioxidants away from that. Take your other supplements away from that. Um, I would fall more so on that far right side that I don't think that antioxidants are really going to protect the cancer cells. They're going to be protecting your healthy cells more so, but I don't have any proof of that. So I would say stay, uh, you know, take your antioxidants just away from, meaning time-wise, uh, of your chemo pill. Next question. I read... That it is likely to experience that is likely to experience a small electrical shocks during use of the rife. I honestly haven't felt anything, any electrical shocks. Um, is that normal? So it's it's not very common that a person feels electrical shocks when they're using the rife. It usually happens um, in drier months when there's a lot of static electricity in the air when you have a lot of static electricity in your house, um, if you are dehydrated or the house is dehydrated. Um, and even at that, it doesn't happen always, even at that. So uh, it's, it, is, it can be um, common, it can be uh, not necessarily common, but not uncommon, but it's, it's not something you're looking for, so. Next question. Uh, I seem to have several persistent conditions that started prior to the Rife machine use. So this is a person that just started with the Rife, just started with us. And these, uh, these uh, conditions uh, persist to today. Uh, one is little to no appetite, taste buds, uh, not so good. All foods have uh, no or bland taste. Well, I have to look into this person's history a little bit, but there are some things that could cause lack of appetite, uh, lack of taste. And it can be anything from a sinus condition to we've noticed with uh, uh, a virus of as of late um, that you can lose your taste. So virus uh, infections, viral infections that affect the nasal glands could cause that. Um, 
uh, anything that can affect olfactory uh, taste can cause that. Your taste buds are innervated by cranial nerve 11. So anything that's affecting that can cause taste issues too. Typically chemotherapy does that. Anybody who's been on chemotherapy has lost their taste. So that I have to dig into some personal things about this person. Tiredness, low energy. Well, that's probably the most common uh, complaint of a person with cancer. And that's how I notice Personally, if, I, if, I, if I'm noticing a lot more fatigue and my energy is just, I just feel down in the dumps, I know that my cancer is active. Now for me, praise God, it hasn't been, um, uh, that hasn't been since March, but, um, but that's, that's a very common issue with people with cancer. And why is that? Because a cancer that's active is sucking up all your glucose <laughs> because it's trying to feed on pyruvate for sure, looking for a fuel source, and then your other cells don't get that. And what does do, what does your other cells do with glucose? It makes energy, and I explained at uh, length more than anybody wants to know um, a few minutes ago. So that's the biggest complaint that a person with cancer has is low energy. Chest and back pain, difficult to rise from a prone and, or sitting position. Again, I have to dig into the specifics of what, where this person's cancer is. If a person has chest pain or back pain upon arising, you have to ask, is it because I stood up and I, my chest hurts? So I have chest pain because I stood up, um, meaning that it has nothing to do with my spine or the physical condition of my muscles, it's because your heart had to increase its blood pressure upon arising, and it could be a heart issue. So that's something you may want to get checked out, um, is just where your blood pressure is at. Um, your blood pressure does have to go up 10 points just from a seated position to a stand position, and that, if it doesn't, it can because it can because of a an adrenal insufficiency. So, if there's an adrenal insufficiency, a person can have dizziness, just feel a little bit faint upon standing, and it can tie to tiredness and low energy. So, a person with no cancer and some faintness upon arising from a seated or lying down position, the first thing a person should think of is adrenal physician, uh, insufficiency. Um, and uh, that should be addressed. And you could, my first go-to with any adrenal insufficiency is adaptogenic herbs. So adaptogens, we have them on our website, on our store site, there's multiple different adaptogens. So really contact our office if, if that's an issue. But you do want to, if there's chest pain upon arising, make sure you get your heart checked out as well. Now, if it's just a physical because your back muscles are sore, and your spine is sore, you do want to get that checked out to make sure you don't have any some osteoarthritis, which is really common in the upper back and neck area too. Constant uh, salt saliva tastes in my mouth. Find myself wanting to expel accumulated saliva frequently. Um, that's a good question. There's multiple possible answers to that one. I don't know off the top of my head what you're dealing with with that. Um, Let's to dig into that one a little deeper. So I don't have a great question, a great answer for that. I apologize. Questions from the chat. What do you do with the cheek swabs? I had several cheek swabs in my binder, wondering how often they should be sent in. Oh, good question. So in your binder, it does state if you do want a kinesiology recheck, then that's what you use the cheek swabs for. Do a cheek swab, put it in the bag, seal it up and mail it back in. But you do have to email, uh, this person is a distance person. You do have to email Ashley, your liaison, or if you came to the office, it'd be Ann, and you tell them I'm sending a cheek swab in because I want you to check blah, blah, blah. Maybe I want to recheck on my supplements or I'm not feeling well. I don't know what's wrong with me. I have these symptoms. X, Y, Z, and uh, can you please check this? That's what we do kinesiology on and we'll recheck things. Some people, that doesn't happen, but every six months, some people don't ever do that. Some people do it every month. Everybody's different, it's totally your choice. 
Next question, I have a tumor that is right next to the brain stem. We radiated the tumor with less radiation by the brain stem. Now, eight months later, we are noticing there, there is either injury or the tumor is waking up. They want me to take a steroid for swelling. I had that before and got blood clots. So is there something else I can take in place of a steroid? Yes, there is. Um, there's nothing that will decrease inflammation faster than taking a steroid. I'll tell you that. The problem with taking a steroid is long-term steroid use can decrease white blood cell count, so it can suppress the immune system. Oh, well, I don't want to suppress the immune system with cancer. So with my brain cancer patients, I think that it's far better to be on a low-dose steroid, like two milligrams twice a day, um, uh, than it is to have inflammation in the brain and not being able to get nutrition or healing there because of, of the inflammation in the brain. So you have to weigh that out. But in this case, hey, I'm not having horrible symptoms yet. They want me to go on the steroid. Could I do something else? Yes. So the anti-inflammatory nutritional things, the different herbs, you'd think of number one, curcumin or turmeric. So turmeric slash curcumin is uh, top anti-inflammatory for anywhere in your body and definitely the brain. So I would think that. Um, there's uh, white willow bark, there's boswellia, there's uh, uh, um, stiggy nettle, uh, there's um, multiple other herbs too. We have a product that's called Clear Inflam. That's a capsule that is a great anti-inflammatory um, that you could take. It's, uh, it's our private label of Designs for Health Inflammatome. So you might get it under that label. Um, and you can take that. Um, uh, we also have a product called BAM that we make ourselves, and it stands for Brain Anti-Inflammatory Mix, because I actually invented it for brain inflammation, but it's kind of a misnomer. I should just change it to Body infl Anti-Inflammatory Mix, because it's still BAM, uh, because it's, it's not going to be specific to the brain. It's going to be for the whole body. That's in a powder, and I did it in a powder um, because... Um, people wanted to put it in your, their smoothies. The issue with like um, the inflammatome, the clear inflam, is you have to take a lot of those capsules um, and you have to take a lot of these anti-inflammatories. So if you want to really decrease inflammation in the brain, for instance, you really want to get up to about five grams of curcumin. Five grams? My capsules are only 500 milligrams. Well, you're taking 10 of those a day. Another really good product for inflammation that we started using just a couple of years ago is um, a product that is um, patented. It's getting the anti-inflammatory enzyme from beets. So you don't get any sugar from the beets, but it's the, just the enzyme from the beets. It's a product called Limitless, Limitless, L-I-M-I-T-L-E-S-S. For just general inflammation, taking a couple of those a day for inflammation that we're talking here about inflammation of the brain, maybe five or six a day. The problem is it's not a real cheap product, but it does really work well. Um, but I would still do curcumin. I would try to get up to about equivalent to about five grams a day of that. I would still look at the clear inflam or the brain anti-inflammatory mix if you're making smoothies because the brain anti-inflammatory mix doesn't taste that good. But if you throw it into a berry smoothie or a protein shake or something like that, you really don't taste it that much. Um, and you can take a whole tablespoon. And we just sell that just at cost. It's a powder. It's not flavored or anything. It's all organic. Um, and it's a, it's a great anti-inflammatory mix. But you really have to be doing a smoothie. Otherwise, it's really hard. Question, can limitless be used for any kind of inflammation? Yes, yeah, it's not anything for any type of inflammation. None of these products that we just talked about are for any specific type of inflammation. It is, it's gonna affect your whole body. So anything you're gonna take orally, it's gonna affect your whole body. It's not gonna just go to the brain or just go here or there. Okay, next question. I want to get the nerve accelerator for phase two detox. The, on the bottle, it says metal genetic nutrition. The label shows all antioxidants. What is the meaning of methyl on the bottle? 
So methyl genetic nutrition is just the name, is just that line of nutrition from professional health products. So your, the Nerf Accelerator is a product from professional health products. Now they have multiple different lines that they sell under that they're, that they're just uh, branding the product as. Methyl genetic nutrition was this whole line of um, brand that they have of nutrition that uh, was created around a genetic testing. Um, so that's all that means. There's no metal products in the product themselves itself. So Okay, how are we doing? If you want to ask a question, then you'll need to raise your hand if you want to speak and or don't raise your hand, just unmute yourself and ask a question or you can send in a chat like I've been reading off of. So you can see with our talk today that some of these questions, you know, were really good questions to ask to a group um, because they weren't specific about a specific thing that was going on with you. Um, and some of these questions were hard to answer because they're going to be, there's some generality to the question and then there's some things that are gonna be really specific to that person. Now, this person sent these questions in, not necessarily wanting to have them on a on the Zoom call, so that's okay. But if we have a question like, that's very specific to what's going on with you, then it's probably best to chat with your liaison, either Ann or Ashley, or set up a time that we can talk so we can get to the bottom of what's going on with you. But there's some generality that we can learn from all these, so I think there, I just thought it was good to still put it on here. Next question, do... We have to be careful not to have the wires of the bulb cross the wires of the bulb cross when using the foot bath. Um, I, I'm not, so I don't. Um, I think it partly has to do with your electricity in your house, how much dirty electricity you have, how much surges you have in your electricity and such um, that can have an effect. Maybe that's a good practice to adhere to. Um, but uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't have the perfect answer for that. I think it's different with people's electricity. Next question, people with mold or candida can't eat mushrooms. Can they still use mushroom extracts? That's a really good question. I get that question often when I'm talking to people individually. And my answer is yes. There's some practitioners that say, no, they shouldn't use mustard, mushroom extracts either. Um, I don't agree with, I just don't agree with that. So I, but I do believe that there are people that are, can be sensitive to anything. So they can certainly be sensitive and react to mushroom extracts, even not having mold or candida. So, um, nothing is perfect for everybody. Um, so, uh, you do have to be careful about that. So if you do have a history of mold or candida, then, um, just uh, test it, you know, try it, see if you react negatively to it or have any effect negatively, then be careful about that. What is the Nagalase test and are you offering it? The Nagalase test is measuring Nagalase in the blood, um, which is an enzyme and it's only done in a lab in Europe. Um, you, there is a, there is a, they have a sub lab in, I don't know where it is, Oklahoma or something like that, where you send the test to, and then it gets sent off to Europe. Um, uh, I, I know, I think it's a good test and it's a test that is, that you could kind of monitor your cancer with. So, um, I think it's a valid test, uh, and it's accurate. Um, I know they were having trouble offering it in the United States for a while last year. I, I think they're back on track again. Um, I tell people though, if they wanna monitor their test, and that could take three, four weeks to get it back. 
probably better off doing the um, HCG uh, test that you send it to the Philippines with because it's far less expensive. The Nagalase test could be two, three, four hundred dollars, and the one in the Philippines is what sixty five dollars. Still takes three weeks to get it back. Just make sure if you're doing the one in the Philippines that you send it regular mail, so it just looks like a uh, a letter, um, so that uh, the bad guys don't think it's there's value in it and confiscate the mail. So don't send it any other way, just but regular USPS. What are your thoughts on EMF causing radiation? Do you recommend any devices, et cetera, to protect yourself? Yeah, so EMFs can be very dangerous, um, especially for those with brain cancer, with those with mold, with those with Lyme, with those with the specific gene um, that if you have defects in this one gene family, you're gonna be more sensitive to EMFs. Um, uh, they're not good for any of us. Certainly 5G is, in my thoughts, probably just a weapon. Um, it is, um, it's very dangerous. So what do you do to protect it? That's the tricky part. Um, you, you, if you are very sensitive to EMF, you stop using a cell phone. <laughs> Um, or uh, you keep your cell phone in a um, Faraday cage sleeve. We have those available on our store for very inexpensive. They're a cloth sleeve that you just put your cell phone in and you can put it in the pocket. It literally shuts your cell phone off. The negative of using that is that it literally shuts your cell phone off from any um, receiving any messages. So if you turn your cell phone off, it can still receive messages and still be a source of EMFs. But if you put it in a little Faraday sleeve, you literally block everything. So you 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 could the cell phone itself will still run eternal internal things like um, like a um, an alarm. So if I have my alarm set for right now, if I have it in the Faraday sleeve, it'll the alarm will still go off and I can hear it. So I can pull it out of the sleeve and turn my alarm off. But in the sleeve, I can't receive any calls. I can't receive any texts. I can't receive any messages, anything like that. But if as soon as I pull it off my, out of my sleeve, just like if you just turn on a phone, if you turn it off, it'll go ding, 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 ding. You have seven messages. So, um, but that's a good way to protect it. You can put it when you're not using your phone. You don't need to receive phone calls right now. Um, you're just kind of putting your phone to sleep by slipping it into a sleeve. So back to where do you get EMFs and how do you protect it? You get EMFs, okay, number one, from cell phone towers and from your cell phone. That's the biggest source of EMFs. You get, you get, you can't, unless you move away from all cell phone towers, you're gonna to be exposed to it. So the farther you away are, are from a cell phone tower, the better you're off or you are. Number two, um, by keeping your phone protected, we also have hedrons that you can put on the back of your phone, but they don't work nearly as good as a Faraday sleeve. Um, there's EMFs that come from your Wi-Fi. We have Wi-Fi router bags that you put over your Wi-Fi router that block a lot of the EMFs, but still allow some of the Wi-Fi to go through. So they're not as strong as those sleeves. It's otherwise it'd shut off your Wi-Fi. Good idea is to shut off your Wi-Fi at night. You're not using it at night. Have it on a little uh, uh, strip that you could just click the button and it shuts off the Wi-Fi at night. You can shut it back on in the morning. Um, protecting your house from dirty electricity. I mentioned early, dir earlier, dirty electricity is surges in your electrical system where you're getting EMF exposure just from your house and your, your own electrical wires that run around your house that you're exposing yourself to. And that's with the SATIC uh, products that we have on our website too. Um, I would have our house connected to a whole house static um, uh, uh, box that um, I had an electrician wire in. And then, uh, uh, so those are the main things you can look on our store and search EMFs on our store, and you'll see a whole bunch of different products that will help protect you. And that's the whole idea. It's about helping protect you. Nothing is going to keep you from EMFs. There is EMF clothing out there. Um, again, it 
It doesn't block all EMFs, no matter what they say, but it is helpful. So uh, anything is a help. So the, for, to the people that are very sensitive to EMFs, then, um, then going all those routes, as many of those as possible, the better. Uh, and they find that they feel a lot better. There's actually an area in the United States, in Virginia, that there's no EMFs. And it is an area that is blocked because it's, I think it's around the uh, Hubble tubles, telescope or something like that, or some big telescope or something. So within an eight mile radius, there's, there's no EMFs. And people that are highly sensitive to EMFs have actually physically moved there. Now, you can't get internet, you can't get anything there, nothing. So there's no Wi-Fi, no internet, your cell phones don't work, you have to drive out of the area to get cell phone coverage. Um, but it can really calm people's nervous system that have highly sensitivity to EMFs. I had a patient with brain cancer once that um, she, um, uh, they had to unplug, they had to move, her husband had to move their refrigerator out in the garage. She couldn't have any appliances going in the house where she would uh, start to have a seizure. And um, so that went on for a couple of years, I think, before uh, we got the inflammation down to the point that she was able to um, bring the refrigerator back in the house. Uh, but uh, interesting case. So any inflammation in the brain is going to cause an increase sensitivity to EMFs. You see that with any microglial priming caused from concussions, microglial priming caused from, from uh, tumors or brain cancer of any kind um, will cause a sensitivity to EMFs. Any other questions? By the way, that question about not wanting to do radiation again on the brainstem, I actually have a video on what I just mentioned, because I just thought of it saying it, microglial priming. I think it's a, just search on our blog, brain inflammation. I think it'll be under that. And I have a video on what, what microglial priming is. So, um, and what to do about it. So we go over all those anti-inflammatory things. Um, so um, that will give you some more insight in that if you want to watch that video and, and learn more about that. How do you feel about three, five or 10 day fasts, water only? or diluted juice, 10 water to one part juice. Okay, so um, also I'm gonna I'll answer the question, but I will point you to our blog post about fasting mimicking dieting and intermittent fasting and uh, TRE, which is time-restricted eating. So um, the information about fasting, I know we have cancer patients that have fasted and a 10 day fasted felt like it really cleaned them out or really helped halt their cancer. So I'm not going to diminish the fact that that can work for people. But the studies on fasting are after 24 hours fasting, your IGF-1 levels go up. So IGF-1 is, is, is part of the growth hormone factors. So um, that's not good for a cancer patient. So there is benefit to doing longer fasts um, but for a cancer patient, we don't recommend more than a 24 hour fast for that reason. So um, we recommend if you want to fast, fast, you know, you can fast a 24 hour fast, but then break it, eat, and then you could, you know, eat for, you know, a day and then you can go on another fast. But doing more than a 24 hour fast raises IGF 1 levels, according to all the studies. So you do increase growth factors. Now, that's good if you don't have cancer. You do want to raise IGF 1 levels um, to a point uh, because growth hormone helps build muscle, helps build um, tissue. Um, so it can be beneficial. But not with cancer patients. So we don't recommend more than a 24 hour fast. 
and we recommend time-restricted eating. So meaning that you're only going to eat within a window of maybe five hours of the day. So you're going to skip breakfast, skip lunch, and you're going to eat at three o'clock and you'll eat till eight o'clock. I'm not talking about eating the whole time, but that's your window of eating. And then you stop eating till the next day till three o'clock. So that's time-restricted eating. Uh, um, it's also intermittent fasting in a way. So just look on our blog about that that will help explain that too will the hyperbaric uh, oxygen chamber be helpful in reaching my brain tumor the answer is absolutely so hyperbaric oxygen really shines with brain issues not just brain cancer but with any brain issues so um, uh, hyperbaric oxygen is a great tool for a lot of things. It helps with other tissues too, not just brain, but most of the studies on hyperbaric are with brain cancer, with Parkinson's, with dementia. Uh, so the negative about uh, HBOT is that you got to do it very regularly. So we, our, our HBOT in our office is the most underused piece of equipment that we have because most of our patients are not local. Um, and if you have breast cancer, there's probably better, local, there's better therapies, in my opinion, than the HBOT. So, um, but for uh, any brain issues, for brain tumors, definitely HBOT is great. If you have the ability to purchase your own HBOT, you can find them used. Um, that would be great as well. Um, because then you have it in your house, you can climb in there, read a book, turn it on for an hour, and it's taking an hour of your day versus having to drive to a clinic, do it, come home, and it's taking two, three hours of your day. So, but you do want to do it very regularly. By very regular, it'd be best to do it daily. Um, and, and unfortunately, all the studies with HBOT, literally all the studies are doing it five days a week. So, it's really hard to know whether doing it less time will be as effective. Now, we've had some brain cancer patients come in twice a week um, and have great results with it, uh, but uh, they were doing so many other things. I don't know if it was the HBOT or it was the right, or it was the nutrition or what. So I, I don't know. It's hard to determine that. Is there anyone who should not use a sauna? Yes, me on a day like today. It's 90 degrees. Just have to go outside and you're in a sauna. So yeah, I mean, there's people that um, can be sensitive to heat. Um, people that have, you know, uh, uh, I have to think about that a little bit. There's people that can be sensitive to to high heat and can break out in a rash. I have had patients that have done that. Um, but in that even to that discussion, maybe breaking out in a rash after a sauna is a good thing. Your body's trying to detox through your skin. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, personally, I use the sauna where my head is exposed because I feel like I can't breathe in the sauna that I'm in there. Um, uh, fully in a sauna. Maybe that has to do with my sinus condition. But uh, yeah, I don't have a great answer for that question. Sorry. Okay, should we call it a day? Great questions today, as always. Again, reminder, you can email questions and just please put Zoom call questions in the, um, in the uh, subject area of the email. Thanks for being such a great group and um, uh, as always, I'll be praying for you guys and hope you'll be praying for our clinic and, and all of us here. 
Uh, and again, if you have specific questions that are very specific to you, please um, talk to your liaison or schedule a time with myself or Michelle, and we'd love to chat with you and um, make sure we get those answered. We are always here for you. I always think it's very sad when I have patients that are not doing well or something and they're never on the zoom and they never reach out to us um you know with your plans you we you have us at your disposal but you know we don't know what's going on with you at home so make sure that you reach out if there's any issues or if you're struggling in any way all right i'll be praying for you thanks again everybody go have a great rest of the day and we will be back next week Bye-bye.